Well, my name is Chase, and I'm one of the pastors here, and, and honestly, today I'm supposed to be finishing out this series called Emotions, where we've been talking about some fun stuff. You know, we started out talking about anxiety and worry. What a joy that was, yeah. Uh, and then, you know, I got to come back up here and talk about anger. And that was great. Um, and, and then, thankfully, Trent stepped on the stage last week and talked about joy, and how we can have joy and that Jesus from the beginning of his life to the end of his life, all he did was bring joy into the world. And I was supposed to wrap this up this week talking really about sadness, how, how God comforts us and, and is compassionate with us when we're hurting and how we can be compassionate with others when they're hurting. And, and I got to be honest with you, uh, I've, on Monday, I just didn't feel like talking about sadness today. I felt like this is such a happy time in the life of our church, such a unique time, maybe a little scary time, and, and I just wasn't really sure if I wanted, I already did anger and worry. I didn't want to do sadness. This is like a downer, okay? So I sat Monday night outside just, just praying and saying, okay, God, I will talk about sadness, but if you open up another opportunity for me to talk about something else today, is there something that could bring encouragement and challenge to us based on where we're at as a church and based on how, how, where anyone is at in their life trying to follow after Jesus? So I sat outside Monday night just, just praying and thinking, and, and I will talk about sadness if I need to, but if there's anything else. So I started to just cycle through passages and stories in my mind that I knew from scripture, just hoping that, that one of them would kind of stick, that one of them would stick out to me. Because I believe any time that we open up God's word to a passage, it can teach us something about what God has for our life. And any story that we find in God's word helps us learn more about the character of God and who he is and how he interacts with his people so that it can help us figure out how to interact with him still today. And so I just started just like flipping through these stories in my head and one of them just jumped out at me. And I paused there for a second and I started just chewing on how can this be challenging and encouraging in our season today and, and I really think that, that God kind of gave me a little bit of a permission, maybe a little bit of a nudge to allow me to just not talk about an emotion, okay? So today's emotion message is not about emotions, okay? Can you deal with that? Anybody angry? Anybody worried? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody sad? <laughs> All right. Whew. All right, good. Uh, we're going to talk about, it had, this, this message has no title. I don't have four points to a better life or anything like that. I just want to walk through this story and pull out a couple things that I thought were relevant to the season that not only our church is in, but anyone right now that is trying to faithfully follow after Jesus. I think this story can be of encouragement and challenge to you. Uh, it was to me as I started to unpack it today. So interesting enough... The story I want to talk about kind of follows up where Trent left off last week. Trent talked about the Israelites parting the Red Sea, right? They got part of the Red Sea. They walked through the Red Sea, and then they went into the wilderness. And we're going to kind of pick up what happened about 40 years later. But there was this time period post the Red Sea, pre-promised land. God led them out of Egypt to take them to the promised land. But it took them 40 years of wandering and waiting in the wilderness for God to mold them and shape them and prune them into the people that he wanted them to be. God had to get some of the Egypt out of them to get them into the promised land. God didn't want them to bring some of the ways they had learned over 400 years that were not godly and not good and not holy and not righteous. He had to, to get rid of some of that and shape them and mold them into the person that he was calling them and creating them and wanting them to be so that the whole world could benefit. The, the waiting and wandering in the wilderness was a wonderful time. Although... I doubt they felt that. And so after 40 years of this, they finally get to go to where they are called to go, to the promised land. Moses dies off. Joshua becomes the, kind of the new leader, the new Moses. And, and God says, Joshua, I want you to lead your people to the banks of the Jordan River. And across the Jordan River is the land that I've promised to you. They could got so close they could see it probably. And that's where we're going to pick up our story today. We're going to be in Joshua chapter 3. If you don't know, uh, you open your Bible, any Bible. If you need a Bible, take a Bible, keep a Bible, read a Bible. We want you to have a Bible, okay? Uh, but we have them for free back there. If you have your Bible, it's at the beginning. You just go Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, okay? If you get to Judges or Ruth, you went too far. And then you just open up to Joshua. You find the little Joshua at the top. Find the big number three down here. That's where we're going to be. Again, I just want to read a story to you. 
pull out some things that I think were challenging and encouraging to me that I think will be challenging and encouraging in your walk with Jesus. Uh, here we go. It says, early the next morning that Joshua uh, and all the Israelites left Acacia Grove and arrived at the banks of the Jordan River where they camped before crossing. Three days later, the Israelite officers went through the camp giving these instructions to the people. When you see the Levitical priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God, move from your position and follow them. Since you have never traveled this way before, they will guide you. Since you've never gone this way, since you don't know where you're going, make sure that you follow them for they will guide you. 40 years in the wilderness, it's finally time. He leads them to the banks of the Jordan River. They're so close they can smell it. It's like, it's right there. And then he says, for three days, you need to wait. <laughs> That's funny, isn't it? It's always interesting how God's timings works when it's not in your life, right? It's always like, man, that's cool. I'm glad how God works out that way with you. That they got 40 years of waiting and then they had to wait three more days. I don't exactly know why, why they had to wait three more days. But as I started chewing on this and just thinking, sometimes when we have to wait on God, there's purpose in the waiting. Sometimes when we're waiting on God, there's a reason for the waiting. Just because God delays something does not mean that he's denying that from you. Now, sometimes God says no. You pray for something, God says no. His answer is no. But sometimes his answer is not yet. Hey, let's go to the promised land, but wait three more days. <laughs> wait three more days. There's a little bit more that needs to happen before I can welcome you into this miracle and this blessing that I have from you. Sometimes we have to wait on God's timing so that we can see the promises that God wants to fulfill in our life. They waited and they waited again. And if you know anything about the ark, if you, if you know what that represents, the ark represents the presence. I'm sorry, I just caught myself pushing my glasses up. I don't have any on. So I know you didn't need to hear that, but that's just where my mind was like, what are you doing? So if you see it again, I apologize. It's like phantom. I was like, you know, if you have glasses in context, you know how that feels right? I'm not the only one. All right. Anyway, uh, ark. We were at the ark. I'm sorry. Just bloop. Uh, we're at the ark. The ark was this wooden box that was covered in gold. That was this holy box that represented the, the physical presence of God. Inside the ark, they stored some really important things. They stored the 10 commandments, which was God's, um, represented God's teaching for their life. They stored manna, which was this food that God provided them throughout the wilderness where they were wandering every day. They had enough of what they needed. It represented his provision. And then there was this, this staff. It was Aaron's staff. And it represented the, the ruling and the reigning of God and his people. Because Aaron was a part of the Levitical line. And so, so there was a purpose in what was in this box. But for them, it represented God's presence. So I find it really cool that it says, you need to follow the ark. Wherever the ark goes, you go. But if the ark doesn't move, don't move. But when the ark moves, get ready. And I find it interesting because for them, that was the presence of God. They needed to lead, let God lead them. And, and I love this, the ark will guide you. And I think this part right here is my favorite. Um, since you don't know where you're going, <laughs> God's going to lead the way. Now, I, I'm sure some of them could have figured out how to get to where they wanted to go on their own. But God's like, no, no, you don't know where you're going. Let me lead the way. I think this is a powerful thing for our own life that we need to make sure that we recognize that in the waiting, there is purpose. And that if we want to get to where God wants us to go, we have to let God lead the way. We have to let God guide us. So I'm thinking right now about our church, the season that we're in. And some of you know all the story. You've been with us since the very beginning. And some of you are just kind of coming on. And recently you're, you just heard that we're expanding and renovating this building. And for you, it's like, man, this seems really quick. Like, I'm not even sure if I like this church yet. And all of a sudden we're going to have to go to a different place. Like, this is crazy. But this is a long time coming. And I thought as we talked through this story a little bit, I'd share a little bit about the journey that we've been on. Because I think it's helpful and, and encouraging to see how God has been a part of all of this. I really believe that we're on the banks of something special in the life of this church. I do not believe that the building is the promised land, okay? <laughs> That's not the correlation I'm trying to make here. 
Because to be honest with you, the building project has brought a lot of stress and drama and problems and struggles. Might be the most stressed I've been in the last, like, my whole life, honestly. I'm not very stressed. They don't teach you in seminary how to do a building project. I don't know why. They teach you how to read the Bible and preach and stuff, but nowhere did they be like, hey, if you ever have to do a building project, here's what you do. No one taught me that. So we're, we don't really know everything we're doing, but, but it's been a little stressful. So I, 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 it's not the promised land, but we do believe that the building will be a tool that will help us reach more people for Jesus. Our desire as a church is to help people find and follow Jesus, to create more opportunities for more people to hear more about Jesus. And we think that this building is going to be an incredible tool to do that. We think it's going to provide more opportunities for us to impact our community, more opportunities for us to do some really awesome stuff for people that are coming this way. Like, I'm just so excited to see what God is going to do with this building. But the building is not a promised land. It's a headache. (laughs) It's going to be used to do great things. But as we step into this, I, I realize that we have been waiting for a long time. All of this started, and you may not know this, started back in 2020. I know I said a curse word right there, 2020. Um, (laughs) But it all started back then. 2020, early 2020, we started to see God was moving and growing, and and we were on the brinks of not having enough space for just two services. We were thinking about maybe a third service, potentially that fall. So we're like, it's about time to start thinking about what is next. And so early in 2020, I began to become an architect. I don't know if you knew the skill that I had, but I began to draw on my whiteboard multiple renditions of what I thought would be a good building expansion because we needed to start thinking about this. And so here's the first one. I think maybe one of the first ones I ever drew, and there's multiples of these, but this is me uh, working way too hard to do something that mattered very little uh, (laughs) to try and just think through what could this look like? What could this be like? In early 2020, we started doing that and we got to the point where we're like, hey, we should probably get someone, not me, to maybe draw something up. And so we had a more professional drawing done for free because we didn't have money. Um, And so uh, to do that, we had money, but not to do that. And so somebody uh, graciously took what I did and made it better and smarter and began to kind of craft what maybe potentially this could be 2020. March of 2020, we still had an obstacle in our way because we were dreaming about this thing, but we still had a mortgage on our current building and and leadership is trying to be good stewards of what God has given us, trying to be wise. And we said, we shouldn't go like build a new building while we still have a mortgage on our old building. That doesn't seem like wise stewardship. So we were like, okay, God, like we're just waiting. Like we're going to wait. We know that we need to move, but we're going to wait. And March of 2020, um, on a Monday, someone interrupted a meeting I was having with Pastor Trent, and they said, I think you'll be okay with this interruption, and we were handed a check that finished off our mortgage in that moment. God showed up, and he showed off, and we were like, wait, Trent, you know what this means? We don't have that obstacle standing in our way anymore. We're fine. We can start doing this. 2020 is going to be the greatest year ever. Yeah. (laughs) It's going to be awesome. That was on a Monday. On Thursday, the world shut down. That is not a joke. That week, guys. That week. And there's some other crazy things that were happening that week, but but I'm telling you, I'm telling you, there was was God's hand all over this thing from the very beginning. And all of a sudden, we entered what I will call, for today's sermon, the waiting and wandering period of 2020, 21, 22. (laughs) But even in that waiting, when we were like, what just happened? We were about to like start dreaming of breaking ground and all of a sudden we're like, will people ever come back to church? (laughs) But in that waiting period, we saw God move multiple, multiple times, still showing that, hey, 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 my timing's not exactly your timing. I'm gonna work this out for the good of those that love me and are called, but it's gonna take some time. It's gonna look different. But even in that time period, we were able to see God's hand over and over again continue to show us that we were headed in the right direction. But we had to slow down. We had to wait. We had to let God move and do what God does. Two years ago, so it was about two years later, some of our staff went on a conference down in Atlanta and we're sitting at a table and some other pastors came over to this table and I'm a people person, but I was kind of like, here we go, more people I gotta talk to that I don't know if they're gonna like me or not. You know, I'm very insecure in these moments. And we started talking and all of a sudden, one of the guys who's a pastor, one of his part-time jobs was to help churches renovate and expand buildings. What did you say? 
<laughs> so we started talking and he kept saying, eh, I don't want to sell you anything. I just was telling you what I do. I said, no, 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 no. Keep talking. Like five times he said, I don't want to sell you anything. I said, sell me something. All right. <laughs> like sell it. We want to hear about it. So we began a conversation that led to a few months later, his team coming. Here's a picture of his team coming and sitting with our staff as we began to dream and think, do we need a building? Why do we need a building? What would that look like? How would we do that? And we just began to dream. And even at this point, we still weren't back to the, the numbers that made sense to even pursue this, but we were trusting that God was leading and brought these conversations together. And we began to just walk through it all along the way. I mean, God just began to show up. And, and the reason I share all of this is because I want you to understand that as a church, as a church, we've been doing our best to wait on God and let God lead us in this entire project, this entire process. And there's been times where God was like, slow down. And there's been times where we're like, I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but we're going to keep following because we really have seen God's hand leading and guiding us. I believe that he has been and he is in this thing and he has been since the beginning. But here's what I know, that going along with God's timing isn't always the fastest way to get to where you want to go. <laughs> but it's always the best. And if you think about your own life for a second, because to be honest, the building is just a part of my life. And honestly, it, it's not the biggest part of my life. There, there's things that I think God is calling me to. And there's a future that I think God has for me. There, there's, there's a person that he's trying to create. And I need a lot of work. I'm a work in progress and capital progress. And, and I think that, that there's a future that God wants for me and God has for me. And I'm working towards, but I'm not there yet. And I think the same is true for you. I think God has a plan and a purpose and, and purpose for your life. And he has a, he wants to create you into the person that he created you to be. And maybe you're just not there yet. And so as you think about our own life and how we faithfully follow after what God has called us and wants for our life, maybe you feel like you're in a waiting period, a wandering period. Maybe you're not sure why you're not where you want to be just quite yet, but you know that God is calling you to something. And I just want to encourage you that the waiting period can be a working period, can be a good thing. God had to do some work in the lives of the Israelites to, to shape them into who he wanted them to be. And there might be some work that God wants to do in your life or my life or before we get to where he is leading and guiding us to go. Because sometimes we're not ready for the future God has for us. Sometimes we need to make sure that we're actually following God and not really our own way and just saying, oh, God's in this. And that takes time. Trying to let God lead and guide in everything is not easy. It's easier just to do what you want, when you want, how you want it. Did you know that? It would be much easier to just do what feels good in life than to try to faithfully follow after what God has for you. It's harder to slow down and pause and seek God's wisdom and to give God a place and a space to lead you and guide you. But I believe when we go at God's pace, we, we are able to get God's peace. Here's why I say this. I said that this building project has been maybe one of the most stressful things I've ever done. But it's weird. I, I didn't exactly know how to say this because it almost sounds contradictory. But I've been maybe the most stressed, but I've been able to have peace along the way. And that's one of the ways that I think you can know that you're following after the way that God wants you to go is when you can be stressed out and still at peace. You, you can see that it's not all working great. There's drama, there's problems, there's obstacles, there's things standing in your way, but you're going, I know, but I mean, God's in this. God's got my back. God's helping me through. Like there's a way to have peace while you're still stressed out. And that's one of the ways that I, I, I really have seen God still be a part of this. But it's harder to go at God's pace. But just like the Israelites, they had to follow God to get to where they wanted to go. And they had to go at his pace. I believe that we need to do the same in our life. Now, I want to read the next section of what happens in the story. And this is a little bit longer, but there's some really good stuff in here. Okay, so I'm going to read it. Um, you're going to listen. And then we're going to pull some things out that were encouraging and challenging and interesting. Would that be okay with you? All right, I heard one or two, but I got nothing else if that's not okay with you. We just sing and go home. All right, um, then Joshua told the people, purify yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. 
In the morning, Joshua said to the priest, lift up the Ark of the Covenant and lead the people across the river. A little bit later, it says, when you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps into the river and stop there. It keeps going. It says, so Joshua tells the Israelites this. He begins to talk to them. He says, one, look at the Ark of the Covenant, which belongs to the Lord of the whole earth. That will lead you across the Jordan River. Skip a little bit. He says, so the people left their camps to cross the Jordan and the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. It was the harvest season and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. It means the river was as high as it could be. It wasn't just like they tiptoed across the stones. Like this is, it was overflowing. But as soon as the feet of the priest who were carrying the Ark touched the water at the river's edge. Oh, did you see that? Pick the right translation and it says some interesting things. I think this is why Trent likes the NLT version is when it talks about the edge of the river. It calls it the river's edge. Interesting. Anyway, nothing to do with the story. I just thought we should highlight it. The water <laughs> above that point began backing up a great distance away at a town called Adam, which is near Zarethan. And the waters below that point flowed onto the Dead Sea until the river bed was dry. Oh, then all the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. Meanwhile, the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant stood on dry ground in the middle of the river bed as the people passed by. They want, waited there until the whole nation of Israel had crossed on dry ground. There's some cool stuff in here. Now, this story is often overlooked because 40 years earlier, Moses parted the Red Sea. But we often forget that just 40 years later, Joshua, who is now the new leader gets to see God do a miracle and part the Jordan River. So they parted the Red Sea to get into the wilderness and then they wandered for 40 years and then to get out of the wilderness to get to the promised land, God parted the Jordan River. But it's often overlooked because it, we already heard this. And so even as I was thinking about this story, I didn't really think through all the details of how exactly this worked. But there's a few things that popped out that I, I just want to show you. The first thing that Joshua said to the people was purify yourself. Isn't that interesting? Maybe not to you, but to me, I was like, wait, wait, wait. He got them all the way to the Jordan, banks of the Jordan River. He's about to let them cross. And before they could cross, he said, hey, purify yourself today for tomorrow. God's going to do something amazing. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I think it's worth sitting on for just a second. If we're asking God for a blessing in our life, we should be striving to live lives that honor God. If we're asking God for a blessing in our life, we should be striving to live lives that honor God. If we're wanting God to show up in one area of our life, we need to make sure that we give God every area of our life. Or, or let me say it this way. If we're expecting God to answer our prayers, shouldn't we be striving to purify our lives? Yes. Hey God, I want you to answer my prayer. Okay, how's your life? Oh, like I'm not gonna live for you. I just want you to do what I want. man, I'm, just, I'm hoping God blesses me. I'm hoping God blesses this, this relationship. I'm hoping he blesses this, this, this decision I'm making. I'm hoping he blesses my parenting. I'm hoping he blesses my job. I'm hoping, hoping he blesses, but I'm not really gonna like live for him or like do anything to like live righteously and honor him. A lot of times that, that's kind of how it seems to be in the life of some people that we want God to bring a blessing for us without living for him. Do something in my life but I'm not gonna live for you. But here, here's what I know. In James chapter five, it says this, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Of a righteous person, the earnest prayer produces powerful and wonderful results. Now, I'm not saying that if God hasn't answered your prayer right now, that means you're not righteous enough. I am not saying that. I'm just saying that the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power. That if we're asking God to bless us, to, to do a miracle, to, to answer our prayer, to do something in our lives, but we're not living for him, I think we're missing something. And I know if we seek the things of God with all that we are, God will care for our needs. Why do I know that? His name is Jesus. He said this in Matthew chapter six. He says, seek first the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. There it is again. And he will give you everything you need. Live righteously. Seek the things of God first before anything else and he will care for your needs. And my ultimate purpose in touching on this right now is, is to make sure that we recognize God's desire for us to be holy. 
You will always be holy, holy forever. But I don't have to live righteously, but give me what I want. I don't think that's how the song goes. God's call and desire for us is that we would be holy for he is holy. To be like him, to be holy, to be righteous, to live righteously, to live for him, to pursue him, to follow after him. And if we're pursuing him and following after him, that is when we get to see God show up and do what only he can do. When we follow God, it means we have to do what he says. It means we have to open this up and see what he wants us to live like, what he wants our life to look like, what he wants our relationships to look like, how he wants us to think, how he wants us to act. How we we got to see the life that God has laid out for us and see what honors and pleases and glorifies him. And then we need to actually do what he said. Joshua told the priest, go to the edge of the riverbanks and then step in the water and then I will part the waters. Did you catch that? You have to take a step into the water before the waters will part. Now, I'm not exactly sure why God did this, but he could have just parted the waters a mile out and he said, hey, that's where you're going, run. <laughs> and they would be like, man, this is awesome. Following God is easy. I can see the future. I can see where I'm going. I can see how he's gonna get me through the obstacles. This is great. But instead, they had to step into the water and then the waters parted. Oftentimes, I think God wants us to take a step of faith before we can see the blessing or the miracle or see what God's going to do. Often, I'm not saying this is how it works all the time. Sometimes God just blesses you because God is good. We don't deserve any of his blessings, but oftentimes he wants us to take a step. Peter, he got to walk on water, but what did he have to do first? He had to get out of the boat, right? He can't walk on water if he's still in the boat. His feet had to get wet before he got to see this incredible miracle and witness a great, great thing. He had to step out of the boat. And I think there's something to be said about the fact that they stepped in the water and then this happened. Now, we're almost done. One of my two favorite parts of the story is right here. A part that I didn't see before because I was so used to Moses parting the Red Sea that I never really thought about how the Jordan was parted by God. But the detail mattered to me. Here's my, one of my favorite lines from this whole thing. Meanwhile, the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant stood on dry ground in the middle of the riverbed as the people passed by. Now, when Moses parted the Red Sea, well, God did it through Moses, he lifted his staff, the waters parted, everybody walked through, he turned around and closed the water, okay? But for some reason, I just think this is interesting, when they crossed the Jordan River, as soon as the Ark, which represents the what? presence of God, as soon as God stepped into the water, the waters parted. And as long as God was in the middle, the waters remained at bay and everyone was able to pass through on dry ground. And it just got me thinking just a little bit. As long as God was in it, God was providing and protecting. As long as God was in this thing they were doing, God was taking care of them. And I started thinking about my own life that as long as God is in this thing that I'm doing. If God's in it, I want to be a part of it. And if God is leading you and guiding you and, and you're headed that way, then God's going to care for you. It's not going to be perfect, but he's going to provide and protect. It's not going to be free of stress or obstacles or drama. But if God is in it, you cannot fail. If God is in it, you cannot fail. Years ago, uh, it was like maybe eight years ago, just before I moved here, um, I was talking with a friend of mine back in South Dakota, and, and I would just be honest with you, I was afraid I was going to fail. Anybody ever been afraid to fail? Okay, good. Whew. I felt alone for just a second there. I thought I failed that question, okay? <laughs> I was afraid to fail. That, that, to be honest, I, I didn't know if I could lead a church and I was kind of nervous that maybe I would lead this thing into the ground, that maybe I wasn't gonna be good enough, that, that maybe like the whole church would shut down or you would fire me and it would be a big fat, fat failure. That's what I thought. But this friend of mine, she said, hey Chase, if God is leading you, leading you, you cannot fail even if externally it looks like you failed. I said, could you say that one more time? Because I got to put it in my phone to remember for the rest of my life. And it was, it was just this moment that I needed. She said, look, even if 
On the outside, it looks like you failed. If you took this step because God was leading you and God was in it, it's not possible to fail if you're following God. So I could have moved here and the church could have shut down and I would have been like, I didn't fail. (laughs) Thankfully, that didn't happen. Or you could have fired me. Thankfully, that didn't happen. But as as, (laughs) as long as God is in it, you can't fail. It's not possible to fail if God is leading you. And I started thinking about this building expansion as, as, as I started thinking about this story. And to be honest, early on, there, there was some, some nerves and some anxiety and some stress about the whole project because it costs money. And it costs lots of money. And we began to talk in terms of, of millions of dollars. And I'll be honest with you, I don't normally talk in terms of millions of dollars, okay? I like the dollar menu at Taco Bell, all right? <laughs> But once it gets past like $5, I'm like, whoa. And they've gone from dollar menu to value menu. Just, I'm not going to complain about it. I'm just going to say it's no longer a dollar. Okay? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so I'm not used to talking in these terms. And that's what we learned even four years ago, that this was going to cost millions. But I remember one of our lead, uh, leadership team members, I remember he said this thing. And it's funny because this person is... Um, how do I say this? Uh, this person is normally very reserved and, and very good steward of how we handle God's money. And so to hear this person say what I'm going to say was, was surprised me a little bit. But he said this four years ago, before we had any idea what we were doing, he said, if God is in it, the cost doesn't matter. If God is in it. Now, that doesn't mean we can spend as much as we want to be crazy, but he's saying, if God is in it, he's going to provide. He's going to lead us and he's going to guide us and he's going to help us overcome whatever obstacle comes that way. If we're doing this for ourselves, it, it might fail. It probably will fail. But if God's in it, we can't fail. And we have seen God over and over over the last few years help us and continue to help us lead us through some of these obstacles that have come our way. Over the last few years, we've raised over $3 million for this project. That doesn't make any human sense, I'll be honest with you. But God has been a part of it from the beginning, in the middle of the waiting and wondering, wondering if we would ever even open the doors again and what that was gonna look like, if people would ever come back. And he was in it after that, and he's been continued to be in it. And as we brought people together in the fall to invite you to be a part of this with us, God continued to show his leading and guiding. And so I share this because I think it's important as we step into the season, meeting in a new location and the challenges and inconvenience inconveniences that will come with it that we remember as a church that God has been in this leading us and guiding us all along the same is true for your own personal life see if God is in it and he's leading he can provide and protect he's got your back if he's leading you somewhere he'll open doors he'll close doors if he's calling you to something he can protect you through it if you're seeking after God and loving God he will work all the things together for your good why do we know that Romans tells us it says, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes for them. Now listen, it's God works everything together, the good, the bad, the ugly, for the good of those who love him. This is not a promise for every human on the planet. This is for those who love him, who are seeking after him, who are letting him lead and guide their life, who are living righteously, who are pr- pursuing holiness. This is for those that love God. And it's not that he works all things together for your comfort and removes all obstacles and no more pain and no more stress, but for your good. Not happiness, not comfort, but good. And it's according to his purposes, not ours. His way, not ours. But that's a great promise. So I believe that, that God will help us walk through it based on his word. We have to trust him even when we look around and see the challenges. So let me wrap up with this. This is my favorite part and we're gonna be done, okay? If you read the ending, the next chapter, here's what happens. It says that God told Joshua to go send some people to grab 12 stones that they had to put on their shoulders. So these are big stones and bring them out of the water and stack them in a pile to make a memorial outside of where they're going to camp. And here's what it says happens. It says there at Gilgah that Joshua piled up the 12 stones taken from the Jordan River. Then Joshua said to the Israelites, in the future, your children will ask, what do these stones mean? Then you can tell them. This is where the Israelites crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the river right before their eyes and he kept it dry until you are all across, just as he did at the Red Sea when he dried it up until we had all crossed over. He did this so 
all the nations of the earth might know that the Lord's hand is powerful and you might fear the Lord your God forever. I love this part. And I would just say this, that you and I need to find ways to remember God's faithfulness and goodness in our past to help us take steps in our future. We have to. I think we need to find tangible ways to remember how good and faithful God has been in our lives so that as we step into the future, we can trust him for what's coming next. Not just for yourself, but did you see who else? Your children and the whole nation, the whole earth, so that they can know that God is powerful and that we should fear him. Not be afraid of him, but respect, honor, be in awe of who he is. I think we need to remember what God has done so we can keep taking steps, trusting him in our future. And I love how it's a tangible thing, like take a stone and build a monument. Now, I don't know if it makes sense for you guys to put a bunch of stones in your house. That might be weird. But I want to encourage you to maybe, maybe find a tangible way to remember the faithfulness and goodness of God in your life. So that you can keep stepping and trusting him even when you start to see the obstacles and it doesn't make sense. And so that your children can know the things that God has done in your life so they can, they can stand on those things to trust God in their life. And so that everyone around you, your friends, your coworkers, your family can say, wow, what is that? And you can say, oh, let me tell you the story about how God worked in my life before. So I began to do this in my office uh, just a couple years ago trying to make sure that I would capture the moments that I felt were big moments in the life of this church or moments that I wanted to remember to see that what God has done. And so in my office, well, you won't see it now because we've got to tear the building down. But, uh, <laughs> but, but yesterday or two days ago, whenever I stabbed this picture, I began to take pictures to see God's movement. And, and I'm not going to explain them all because I don't have time. But, but this was the very first Skype call we had when I was still in South Dakota right afterwards. You can't see how sweaty I was, but let me just tell you I was sweaty. And uh, this is when we met Trent and some of the other team on the phone. And I had no idea what was going to happen next. But that was the beginning. And then as you just kind of walk through, there's so many things that happened over the years where God has just been good and faithful along the way. For me, this is just a, a way that I'm remembering the faithfulness and goodness of God so that I can remember as we hit challenges and obstacles, as I try to faithfully follow after him, I remember how good he was before. And that we can trust him to be good again. So if I had to wrap up today, again, I didn't have a, <laughs> didn't have a title for the message. I'm still not sure what you would say this message is. Uh, so we'll let someone else name it. We'll just name it the story of that one thing in the Bible. Um, but I would wrap it up with these four sentences. It's hard to go slowly to allow God a space and a place to God, but it's always best. If we're asking God for a blessing in our life, we should be striving to live lives that honor him. Live for God. Live righteously. If God is in it, God will provide and protect through it. Not everything will be perfect, but he will provide and protect along the way. You could say it this way. If God is in it, he's got your back. And when God walks us through something, we need to remember it, not only for ourselves, but we need to share it with others so that we can continue to spread the faithfulness and goodness and the mighty power of our God to the whole world. Let me pray. Lord, thank you uh, for your word and your truth and another opportunity to sit in a place to hear your word. And I pray that there was some challenge, but also encouragement for us as we're trying to faithfully follow after you in our own life. And I pray that there's anyone in the room today that, that wants to take steps of faith to follow after you, but they don't even have a relationship with you. I, I want them to know that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. And that before we can faithfully follow you, we need to take the first step of faith and believe that Jesus came and died and rose again for our sin and our salvation. And that we can be in a relationship with you that starts now and lasts forever. But it takes us inviting Jesus to be the Lord and leader of our life, believing that he came and died and rose again for us. And then we can faithfully follow you. And along the way, God, help us to remember all the ways you have provided and guided and led and shown up, been powerful, been faithful, been good. And that we would tell others about it. Pass it on to our children. Pass it on to our friends. And we'd live for you for the rest of our life. It's in your name we pray. Amen.